and once again astronomers were able to create an incredible map. The map that you kind of see right here. And the map that might not make sense right now, but it will make sense once this video is finished. In some sense, this is the largest map of black holes in the visible universe. But to be more exact, it's the largest by volume map of most quasars out there. An all-sky quasar catalog, now referred to as Quaya, that contains nearly 7 million individual objects visible right here. And so, hello wonderful person, this is Anton, let's briefly discuss this new discovery, but let's actually talk about quasars, and I guess history of their discovery, and of course why they're important, just so that you understand the significance of this new map. And all of this kind of starts back in the 60s. This was the beginning of radio astronomy, and during this time there was a third major release of various radio sources from across the universe, published back in 1959. And it basically contained a lot of different radio objects we never knew existed. But one of these objects was super mysterious. You see it right here. This is an object now known as 3C273, 273rd object from that third release by Cambridge. And the reason it was unusual was because it resembled a normal star like our sun, but it was extremely bright in radio waves, or as it's known in astronomy, it was radio loud. And this radio loudness could not be explained right away, but more similar objects were discovered very quickly. All from the same catalog as well, and all with very similar properties. Super radio loud, despite appearing similar to a star. And these very strange radio emitters at first made no sense whatsoever. But this was basically the dawn of modern astronomy. Around the same time researchers also discovered pulsars, they also started to discover things like the cosmic microwave background, and so a lot of these new discoveries at first made no sense. But this was really strange, for one other reason. When they actually looked at the spectrum of these stars, trying to find out what sort of components or what sort of elements they contained, for some reason they contained spectra we've never seen before. Various strong emission lines that did not match any known element. And you can imagine what kind of a surprise this was. Here we had these very unusual stars with huge radio emissions, but containing what seemed to be unusual unknown elements. And as you can imagine, this led to a lot of speculation. But it wasn't long until someone actually cracked the mystery, which made everyone go, oh, that's what's happening. Turned out that if you were to shift the spectrum of the light by a relatively large amount, it all suddenly started to resemble the spectrum of hydrogen. But hydrogen that was moving away from us at a very, very high velocity. Nearly 50,000 kilometers per second. And so in other words, this was a discovery that a lot of these emissions were actually redshifted from us, implying that all of this was a result of the expansion of the universe, and all of this was at a very, very far away distance. This was actually originally discovered by the Dutch astronomer Martin Schmidt, and later confirmed by a Taiwanese-American astronomer Hon Yi Chu, who, upon reading about these unusual quasi-stellar objects with radio emissions, accidentally proposed the term quasar that stuck since. And so the discovery of these very distant objects at what seemed to be billions of light years away from us was a very strange discovery. Strange because it implied these objects were super bright. Tens and even hundreds of times brighter than the entire galaxy. And all of them, at very high redshifts, moving very fast away from us. Because of the redshift of that hydrogen spectrum. And so back then, in 1963, this was an enormous discovery. But it wasn't clear what's happening here. How can we have these very, very bright, extremely powerful stars at such faraway distances? And more importantly, where are they getting all this energy from? Nuclear physics back then was obviously very popular, and at that point, there was no possible explanation from nuclear physics on how so much energy was produced. And that's because normally, in a typical nuclear reaction, only about 1% of material is converted into energy. And so in order to produce these super bright objects, you would require a huge amount of mass that made no sense. And so an additional explanation was needed. And back then, black holes was not even an option. Mostly because they were extremely theoretical and not particularly known either. And what's even stranger is how quickly some of these energy sources were able to change their appearance. Some of them would even flicker every single day, suggesting that their energy production was either increasing or decreasing by enormous amounts. And so eventually, the only explanation that kind of made sense and the only explanation that the researchers all agreed on involved hypothetical objects, referred to as black holes, that had to be millions if not billions of solar masses in mass. 
and they all had to contain enormous accretion disks. And it was really these accretion disks that seemed to produce these emissions. And so here it's really the friction between atoms as they orbit around the black hole that generates a lot of this initial energy. Surprisingly, the overall energy conversion seems to be nearly 40%. That's compared to just 1% from your typical nuclear power. And depending on where you are compared to the black hole or the accretion disk, you're going to see different frequencies. For example, some of the most powerful X-rays seem to come from the corona of the black hole released in a way that you see right here. So this is where most of the super powerful emissions usually come from. In contrast, as you go slightly farther away, you're mostly going to be seeing ultraviolet light. As a matter of fact, it kind of starts to resemble a really large, really bright star. But the farther you go from the black hole and from the accretion disk, the more the frequencies start to change. At some point it's actually going to resemble very similar frequencies to our sun, then to a typical red dwarf, and eventually it goes into infrared, microwave, and so on. But it's the radio frequencies that are usually the most prominent. And of course the reason these objects were even discovered. Some of them can be millions of light years in length, and are usually associated with extremely powerful astrophysical jets. But one intriguing thing about quasars and their history is just the fact that they were mostly prominent during a very specific time in the universe. And so if we look at the universe right here, most of them seem to be present at a redshift between 2 and 3, or when the universe was approximately 2 to maybe 4 billion years old. So right after the Dark Ages, during the period sometimes referred to as the Galactic Noon. This is when we also observe most of the star formation, and this is when the universe was at its brightest. And so basically 9 to 11 billion years ago, this was also the time of quasars. But interestingly, some have been discovered even farther, or I guess, in the even younger universe. Even though millions have been discovered during the galactic noon, only about 200 have been found beyond the redshift of 6, or essentially in the first billion years of the universe. And only some of them seem to be beyond the redshift of 7, when the universe was only 770 million years old. But the main reason quasars are so important in a lot of different studies is really because they're so bright. You can see them from everywhere. And their light tends to pass through a lot of stuff on the way, literally allowing us to kind of scan the universe as a lot of light from these quasars passes through material between us and them. Which is actually how a lot of scientists were able to, for example, discover the overall structure of the Milky Way galaxy, discover different types of gas or different types of molecules in various galaxies out there, but also discover so many other features and so many different structures in the universe that become visible because of the interaction of quasar light with stuff that it passes through. But, I guess more importantly, in terms of more practical use, quasars, and specifically quasar maps, are essential for modern technology. Anything from modern navigation, to GPS satellites, to a lot of super accurate technology on the planet, actually depends on quasars for very precise positioning. So in other words, just like back in the days when we used stars to navigate, today we use quasars to position ourselves in the universe and to then accurately measure time. You can actually learn more about this in some of the videos in the description. And so now the researchers just released a new one. A new super accurate map that's not just accurate but also in three dimensions with very precise location of over 1.3 million quasars. All discovered using the incredible Gaia telescope which was able to identify 6.7 million of them because they basically resemble stars that don't move anywhere. And out of these 6.7 million, about 1.3 million, were then used for an extremely accurate map that in essence resembles something like this. I guess it kind of looks like lungs or something. But the reason there is a very large chunk missing in the middle is really because of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. This is the area that's blocked by gas from the Milky Way, so even Guy doesn't actually know what's going on behind this. It becomes a little bit more clear if you look at this in two dimensions. So that empty spot, that's the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. But every other spot you see, that's a quasar somewhere out there at various distances. And there are 1.3 million of these spots, making this the largest ever by volume map of the universe with the most precise quasar location. And with the number of quasars present here, this is going to allow the scientists to discover so much more about the universe, calculating everything from the overall distribution of dark matter, the density of the universe, the shape and structure of the cosmic web, but even precisely calculate the motion of the solar system throughout the universe as well. Because each of these is basically like a tiny beacon with a fixed location in the universe. But for the scientists behind the Gaia project, this is once again a bit surprising. 
Guy was never meant to study anything but stars in the Milky Way, yet somehow it managed to discover so much in just the last few years. You can learn about some of the biggest discoveries in some of the other videos in the description below, but here by helping us discover over 6 million individual quasars, in the next few years it's going to completely rewrite what we know about the universe, helping us visualize the universe in a very different way. Because once again, each of those individual spots represents an extremely powerful emitter whose light as it travels across the universe ends up revealing a little bit more information about what's between us and them. And because there are so many out here, we're eventually going to basically scan the whole universe, very likely revealing enormous structures and lots of mysteries in between. But at least for now, that's really all we have. We just have a map, an incredible map, an extremely detailed map, and basically the biggest by volume map of the entire universe, but no actual discoveries yet. But chances are that we will have really cool discoveries in the next few years, because that's usually what happens with these particular maps and with studies similar to this one. And so until those future discoveries, check out some of the previous videos in the description, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support the channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.